All right, it is 12 o'clock, so why don't we go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome everyone to Medical Grand Rounds at the University of Colorado. Really glad that we are back in person. This is uh, the official last Grand Rounds before we take a little bit of a break for the holidays. And so there will be no MGR uh, this coming Wednesday or the following Wednesday. We'll resume on January 11th with Dr. Matthew DeCamp talking about ethics, bias, and artificial intelligence in healthcare. Uh, I do want to wish everyone a happy holiday since we are taking that break. It's the fourth night of Hanukkah tonight. Christmas is in a few days. I hope everybody has time uh, to spend with family and get a little bit of relaxation in over the next couple of weeks. As a reminder, you can scan the QR code there. All Grand Rounds this year are eligible for CME and MOC credit. Um, questions will come from our live audience. Thank you all for being here today, as well as from the Zoom platform. Thank you to the chief residents who will be monitoring the Q&A feature. If you have questions for our chief presenters, uh, please put them in the Q&A today. And now I am really pleased to welcome Dr. Tiffany Gardner and Dr. Dante Mesa, two of our chief medical residents, uh, of whom I am incredibly proud um, and honored to work alongside giving the first of the chief medical grand rounds uh, for this season. So Dr. Gardner did her undergrad work at Oregon State University, where she graduated magna cum laude. She was a medical student at Ohio at, uh, Oregon Health Sciences Center, where she was a presidential scholar. And then we were lucky enough to steal her from the West Coast over here to Colorado, uh, where she served in our hospitalist training track and was in the medical leaders pathway. She has had an illustrious career as a medical resident, um, including 15 publications during her residency period only, including manuscripts, posters, abstracts, and her presentations, including at, at national meetings. I'm also very pleased today to welcome Dr. Dante Mesa. He did his undergraduate work at the University of Kansas in Lawrence. He was a medical student at the University of Illinois, where he graduated AOA and was a member of the Gold Humanism Honor Society. He also is, of course, a resident here at Colorado in the categorical track and the clinician education pathway. And Dante really has done an incredible amount of work in the DEI space here as a resident. He has led several efforts on campus. He's done work with Dr. Julia Limes and Dr. Amir Delpino Jones, uh, soon to be published, and started impressively an LGBTQIA plus advocacy and support group, not only within the medical residency, but for GME wide on our campus. Uh, both of those impressive bits of work are going to come together today to talk about something slightly different, uh, which is the pendulum of patient autonomy. And with that, I will turn it over to our chief medical residents. Thanks, Jeff, for that kind introduction. Uh, Dante and I are really excited to have the opportunity to be here today to discuss the pendulum of patient autonomy. And when we were selecting our topic, we reflected pretty extensively on some of the most formative moments in our medical training. And these moments often were characterized by a significant amount of moral distress, both for ourselves and our colleagues, trying to figure out how to navigate both medical and social complex situations um, and balancing competing values in a time of increasing complexity and unknown uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic. So I just wanna introduce you to a patient, Irma. We'll come back to Irma's case several times throughout our talk. Irma is a 77-year-old woman who has chronic respiratory failure from her COPD. She has metastatic breast cancer for which she's uh, currently undergoing chemotherapy. She has type two diabetes. And she presents to the emergency room with shortness of breath and is found to have worsening respiratory failure from COVID-19. And again, we'll come back to her case a few times. The objectives for our talk are to describe the historical context in which respect for patient autonomy gained momentum, to apply common ethical framework frameworks through clinical cases, to des describe the shifting role of patient autonomy and crisis standards of care, and to, and to debate how the role of patient autonomy should change moving forward. Medicine and the dynamics of the physician-patient relationship look very different today than they did 2,500 years ago. And arguably that's changed more in the last 100 years than in the preceding 2,400. The Hippocratic text to the early codes of the AMA really left no meaningful role for the patient to be involved in medical decision making. And in fact, the practice of benevolent deception or intentionally withholding information from the patient that was deemed to be considered poor for patient prognosis was encouraged, something today that we might consider benevolent, um, sorry, medical paternalism. But there was some logic to this. Confidence and deception bolstered by genteel manners and fine dress really inspired patient confidence in their physicians and in their medical treatment. And in a time of limited efficacy of the medical treatment available at the time, patients really needed to trust that their treatment would lead to a cure. 
And in some ways, our entire profession is built on this early concept of the placebo effect. Um, this practice of benevolent deception is one of the core foundational concepts that makes up the beneficence model of medicine. Uh, the beneficence model is often described as the physician knows best model, where physicians are described as those who command and patients are those who obey. And under this model, the physician really had an obligation to the medical benefit of the patient. And the medical benefit was always synonymous with life prolongation and was always synonymous with overall benefit. And in this context, there really was no role for discussion with patients about their preference, whichever option extended their life was the appropriate path forward. And there was no discussion about quality of life or patient agency. And we see this philosophy um, is pervasive in the medical literature for centuries, if not millennia. This is a quote from the Corpus Hippocraticum from 500 BC, um, where it stated that there's wisdom in concealing most things from, from the patient while you're attending to him, revealing nothing of the patient's future or present condition. And if we fast forward 1800 years to the medieval period, we see a similar sentiment. This is a prominent French surgeon who said, promise a cure to every patient, but tell the parents or friends if there is danger. The surgeon must not be afraid to lie if it benefits this patient. And this beneficence model even pervades the early versions of the ethical codes of the AMA in the late 1800s. Um, here, the, the social contract and the interaction between physicians and patients is described in excruciating detail. We see that patients are described as those who are obedient, they comply, they um, comply with the orders of their physicians really without question. Physicians under this model have an obligation to have unruling, or, inflexible authority over their patients, um, despite being genteel and using sophisticated language in ways that might differentiate them from those who practice quackery of the time. We can see this even further, um, the extreme detail to which this social contract was described in that patients should never wary the physician with the tedious details or events or matters not pertaining to his disease, even as it relates to his actual symptoms. He will convey much more real information by giving clear, concise answers to interrogations, and he should not consider bothering his physician with the tedious details of daily life or family concerns. We saw that this led to a significant power differential in the physician-patient relationship, one that's even more prominent that exists today, and led to a number of unilateral medical decisions that would be considered unsettling at best by today's standards. So for example, an infant that might be born with spina bifida could be reported by the physician to be stillbirth to spare the parents from having to make a difficult decision. Or medical treatment might be withheld from an elderly patient to let nature take its course, all outside of, without having conversations with the family. And the morality of these discussions was only had within the medical community. There was no room for outside voice of philosophers or lawyers, which became prominent in later years. And this was really to support that unfettered trust and obedience of, of patients for their physicians. The first time that we see that this might be changing was around the time of the American Revolution, where concepts like individualism, liberty, and self-sufficiency became the core concepts um, of American, foundation of American philosophy today. Philosophers like John Locke and Benjamin Rush um, espoused this idea that by increased truth-telling and disclosure, patients would become enlightened, and an enlightened patient would have improved medical outcomes. There was also recognition for this idea that patients had a right to self-determination, or that there was room for a patient voice in the medical decision-making process. Additionally, there is this radical idea that perhaps a patient might understand what constituted overall benefit for themselves better than a physician could, and that overall benefit may not be synonymous with medical benefit or life prolongation, and that this became especially true at end-of-life care. And while we see that it took over two millennia to see this tiny shift of the pendulum of patient autonomy, where there was no voice to, hmm, I wonder maybe possibly there is role for a voice, um, but hadn't really been operationalized, that took over 2,000 years but it was really only in the last hundred years catalyzed by the human rights violations that we'll talk about in brief that made this uh, change more expeditious. So for example, in the 1930s, the Tuskegee study, which followed 400 African-American men with known latent syphilis, uh, 
uh, were not given penicillin, which was widely available at the time, in order to understand the natural history of the disease, all without their consent. Then we have the Nuremberg trials, which was one of the most important moments in biomedical ethics and um, in medicine in general, where we recognized that there was a critical, there was critical importance in having informed consent be part of the uh, both research and uh, medical decision making process. And then even in the United States, where patients who were institutionalized in mental health asylums were intentionally inoculated with malaria in order to give them experimental treatment and understand the efficacy and side effects of those treatment all without their consent. It's really this constellation of human rights violations that led to an erosion of trust in the medical and scientific community and formalized this transition from the beneficence model of medicine to the autonomy model, where we understand that there is a central and critical role uh, for the patient's voice to be heard in the decision-making process. And we'll have Dante tell you about the other formal biomedical ethics frameworks that came out of these atrocities. Thank you, Tiffany, for giving us a great historical overview of how we kind of shifted from this beneficence model where patients were really listening um, to their doctors. They were, the doctors were telling them what to do. And as Tiffany illustrated, the patients were just obedient with that model. And then as we learn from all of these things with atrocities and the importance of conformed consent, we learn that there are other pieces of bioethics that do matter. And in regard to this, autonomy came to shine for most folks. And it is what is still shining today or what we feel is the most important bioethic principle to adhere to in modern medicine. And so these bioethic principles um, were solidified by Beauchamp and Childress in 2001. So it's likely that they had the language for these principles back in those early days when they were really adhering to beneficence, but didn't really have them as concrete representations. And so these are what we know today as the four that all physicians try to adhere to when they are caring for patients. Um, the first that we were talking about today, which is autonomy, meaning that people have the right to self-determination. They can make their own choices when they are reasonable beings. Beneficence, meaning that we should do right by our patients. Uh, we need to do right for their decisions and right by each patient that's in front of us. Non-maleficence, that we should not do harm to patients when we make these decisions. So first, do no harm, which we all are familiar with. And then justice, um, the fact that we should treat every patient equally, no matter what they look like, who they are. Every patient coming to the door deserves the same amount of treatment as the previous one. And so we'll highlight this first with a case. So Mr. S., He's a 35-year-old male with a history of generalized anxiety disorder. He comes to the ED for fatigue, malaise, nausea, and vomiting. He tells you that he is worried he has contracted Lyme disease. I apologize if this is triggering for anyone in the room. Um, but he has contracted Lyme disease because he had visited a friend in Massachusetts a year ago, and he knows that Lyme disease is very prevalent there. He never went hiking, never was in the woods, and doesn't recall having any arthropod assault while in Massachusetts. He's demanding that you test him for Lyme disease as it's causing him so much anxiety that he is no longer sleeping. He tells you that a negative test will for sure ease his mind. You as a physician explain to him that it's unlikely he has Lyme disease for several reasons. You explain that you would prefer not to test him and, to and you would rather um, like to talk to him about his generalized anxiety disorder, but he is insistent that you test him. And so we'll pull up a poll everywhere. Here. All right, so this poll everywhere, it is polleverywhere.com slash Dante Mesa 313. And the first question we're going to ask is, what would you do in this scenario? You are the physician, you're seeing this patient. What are your next steps for this patient? And those answers could be that you decide to test him. You can agree not to test him. You can continue to counsel him. Um, whichever that may be, if you were seeing this patient in your clinical practice, what, where is your, um, where are you going to kind of fall on this spectrum? All right, we see some folks are writing to continue to counsel the patient. Someone says yes to testing, so just test him. We have counsel coming up again. Several people are wanting to counsel the patient. Um, treat the GAD, another vote for testing. Follow, continue later. We have declined testing. Great, 
So as we're seeing in this order cloud, a myriad of responses, right, which is what we kind of expected to get with this case is we expected this to be somewhat polarizing. Some people will reassure, they will choose to continue to counsel him. Some people may say, we really need to treat your anxiety. Um, some people are really gonna uh, opt for testing. They say, what is the harm in testing? And so this is gonna go into our second question that you can answer um, is, which bioethic principle are you usifying to justify your decision? So based on what you said in the last question, which of these four principles are you saying this is the one that shines the most and this is what I'm utilizing to make my decision as a medical provider? Great. A lot of votes for autonomy, non-maleficence taking the lead, some for beneficence. Great. So again, as this highlights, it's interesting that as physicians, even though the pendulum of patient autonomy, uh, the pendulum of patients seems to be in the autonomy field, we see that people feel very differently about this case. And it's one of the reasons why we wrote this case is because we knew people may have different viewpoints on what's best for the patient. You could argue the 14% of people who chose beneficence could go either way. You could say, if you're on the side of the fence for the patient, you're saying it's beneficial to test him to relieve his anxiety. I am doing right by him to help ease out of his mind. You could also argue on the other side of the fence that if you said you're using beneficence to not test him, you could say, well, doing right by him means not causing him an unnecessary blood poke and also not causing him undue expense, right? Same with non-maleficence. That kind of can go hand in hand with beneficence in this case. Um, do no harm. You could say like, I do not want his anxiety to get worse and thereby testing him cannot do harm by him. It can actually help him out in that way. So if you're on that side of the fence, on the other side of the non-maleficence fence, you could say like, again, poking him, doing all these things, that to me would cause him harm. And so I'm not going to do those things. And I can explain to him and counsel to him how that may fit uh, a model of non-maleficence to cause him no harm further than what he experienced and maybe just reassure him that he doesn't need the testing. And then autonomy, as we see, surprisingly is our, is our middle um, model here in that most people would argue that for him to be autonomous, for him to say, I want testing in the current patient model, if we were to adhere to that, we would say we would just test him anyway. We know tests are not in short supply, um, theoretically, in this scenario, that Lyme testing is widely available. It's not going to harm us to poke him, to give him the test, give him that negative result in that autonomous decision. It would probably feel a little bit harder to argue that the physician should have their autonomy in the scenario and for the physician to argue that they don't want to test for their autonomous reasons, because that may follow more in that beneficence model that we saw in the early ages where they were just telling folks that we are going to do this, right? And that's where the beneficence model came from, whereas autonomy, we can't, it would be harder to argue. And it's interesting that no one picked justice in this. Um, I agree that I think justice would be hard to justify um, how you could make that fit into this scenario. Uh, you could say that, would you treat every patient who came in the door with the same complaint the same way, being that if this was your sixth patient who came in with exact, the exact same story, are you going to do the same thing for him that you did for patient one? So this one is a little bit harder for us to utilize justice as our um, main principle. But again, this just highlights that everyone has different viewpoints about where this case um, would potentially fall. Okay. And so when we think about autonomy, um, it's hard to think about autonomy as a one-dimensional thing. We always think about autonomy in terms of a context. We usually have a frame of reference, a frame of mind with which we are considering someone's autonomy. So when we were digging through the literature, I feel like the easiest way to potentially have a base understanding of autonomy is thinking about it in terms of age. And so when you are a baby, you have no autonomy, right? Parents make all your decisions for you. And we as a society, medical providers, um, social workers, everyone else kind of decides whether or not the decisions you're making for your child are right or wrong, are good or bad, right? And then as you get older, your autonomy reaches its peak. So we see this linear relationship with autonomy that once you reach adulthood, you are at your maximum amount of autonomy, meaning you are a uh, reasonable being, you can weigh risks, benefits, pros and cons, and you can make an autonomous decision all by yourself. And so if we consider that everyone in this room is an adult, they are in adulthood, and they are at their highest amount of autonomy, there are certain things, though, that we don't necessarily consider when it comes to autonomy in the terms of its context. And when we were looking at this, there's a couple things that kind of stood out to me as potential forces that act on someone's autonomy. The first of those being impositions or restrictions. 
And the second of those being influences. And we'll kind of dive into these two things and how they relate to um, patient autonomy. And the first thing I wanted to really discuss is that in modern medicine today, we kind of think of autonomy as a choice. Or I think a lot of us in this room would agree that autonomy is the patient's ability to make a decision about a treatment option that we are presenting to them. And I crossed off this y-axis in the pre-pandemic phase because I think that we really just viewed this graph as a gradation. It was really just this autonomy choice thing, and we were helping patients to try and make these decisions. So if I give you another scenario that you are um, a provider and a, a patient comes in with a new diagnosis of diabetes. So we'll say that this patient has an A1C of 9.5%. So it's right on that cusp. So it's not quite that threshold that you would start insulin therapy right away or would immediately go to those things. And it's also high enough that you may not feel super comfortable just giving them metformin, for example. And so this patient comes to you. They say, hey, doc, I have a new diagnosis of diabetes. My A1C is 9.5%. What are my options, right? That's a pretty common question that we get from patients. They may not say, what are all my options? Um, and because they're kind of guide, they want you to guide them for your expertise, but they will necessarily, they will usually ask you, what are my options? And so you'll tell that patient, well, there are six options that I can think of that would benefit you best. And I think as physicians, we probably all know that we feel a little bit biased towards some of these medications, right? Some people may prefer to use GLP-1s. Some people may prefer to do SGLT-2. Some people may say, let's just see how metformin and diet and exercise do first, right? This all comes into play. And so ideally, what we think is that this patient represents this gold dot on this graph, meaning that that patient has the highest amount of choice. They can choose from any one of these six options. But when we think about this in a realistic context, we can say, well, what if medication number six is super expensive? This isn't uncommon with GLP-1s because they are often injectables. Some insurances don't cover them, and it's hard for patients to pay for those out of pocket month to month. So we may say, well, actually, that patient then doesn't represent that gold dot because they no longer have the choice to choose number six. So in reality, their autonomy is lessened. It's been restricted because they can no longer choose that as a potential option, despite us giving it to them as an option. And then you could also say, well, what if they can't take drug number three? Um, let's say that for some reason you really like the TZD drugs that we use and the patient has heart failure and they say, well, now you can't use that medication because that's contraindicated. So we can't use that one either. And so again, this further restricts their autonomy in this way that we see that this dot continues to move down the graph. And so not everyone actually is that gold dot. Not everyone can have the highest amount of autonomy or the highest amount of choice, even though it seems that in modern medicine, we think that they can. And this is kind of where a consumerism model comes into play. And I think that dredges up a lot of feelings in us because I think it's really hard for physicians to feel like we operate in a consumeristic model. But realistically, we do present patients with options and we allow them to choose. We allow them to choose what risks and benefits they accept and don't accept. We allow them to choose how much they're willing to pay every month for these medications. And even though we have a preference and we would say, I would love to put you on drug number five, they ultimately can say, no, I want drug number four, right? And that's the model we currently operate in a lot of the time, despite a lot of our expertise and a lot of things that we say, patients ultimately have that decision and that right. And so where does autonomy shine in medicine that kind of goes with this is in shared decision-making. And so the underpinning of shared decision-making is in informed consent. And as we talked about, it's the informed consent movement in bioethics that really shifted things from a beneficence model to an autonomy model to where we really valued what patients were telling us to do. We were giving them pros and cons, risks, benefits, and then they were telling us what is willing to accept for them. And this is how a lot of us practice in medicine today. We engage patients in shared decision-making all the time, whether it's end-of-life care, whether it is starting a new medication for them, this is how we operate um, for modern medicine. And so in the context of autonomy in the pandemic, which is kind of what we wanted to discuss is how autonomy really changed during the pandemic, we wanted to consider what, how do autonomy and public health relate to one another? And when you look at the literature for this, what a lot of philosophers describe is that these are in direct opposition to one another. So autonomy, as it stands, is for the self-person. It is self-interest. They only care about themselves, and they only care to choose a decision that matters to them most. That is in direct conflict with public health. Public health officials actually only care about the collective. They say, we can sacrifice one for the many. It doesn't matter what that one person wants as long as it saves multiple other people. And I know that these are extremisms, these are oversimplifications, but when you boil it down, this is what these principles stand for. One is for the collective and thinking about society as a whole. One is for the self and how to govern one's own self-determination.
And so when we think about this intersection of autonomy and public health, we know that autonomy is very high um, to begin with. But what we're wondering is where does this shift when you consider certain things, certain public health aspects? And so like drinking laws, right? How does that limit someone's autonomy? If you're over the age of 21, it may not, but under the age of 21, it definitely restricts things in adulthood. Speeding limits, also another imposition or restriction. Seatbelt laws and vaccine mandates, which is another hot topic item that occurred a lot during the pandemic. Can we mandate that people get vaccinated for the safety of the public? And what we see is that these aren't necessarily restrictions or impositions on someone's autonomy per se in the traditional sense. Someone maintains the autonomy to make a choice. These choices can come with negative consequences if they choose to, to not do what society thinks is beneficial for the whole. But ultimately, they still maintain the choice. Now, some people would argue that you still impose a cognitive restriction on them, though. It's going to take a cognitive load for them to supersede this law. People under the age of 21 may cognitively be like, I can't do that. I'll get in too much trouble. And so they find that to be an imposition on their autonomy. Others may not feel the same way. I think speeding is the easiest one to understand is that most people in here have probably broken a speeding limit to get to the hospital on time, whether that's for sign out or to see a patient or to do something. Um, and I think that we all accept that risk. We made an autonomous decision to say, I'm going to go five miles over the speed limit because I need to get to where I'm going. And I don't really care, you know, if the law pulls me over, I'll deal with the speeding ticket if it happens, right? So we kind of supersede our cognitive load to still make an autonomous decision in that way. The ways that these can fully restrict you, however, is if you get into too much trouble by violating the laws, you can be imprisoned, as we all know, and that does fully restrict your bodily autonomy. So there are different, again, gradations in which your autonomy can be restricted or at least imposed upon. And so I felt like in reading all of this, the easiest way to understand this in the pandemic sense was to equate public health with public safety, which is what we really talked about in the pandemic is what was safe for the public. And then to equate autonomy with choice, as we talked about earlier, is that we kind of view autonomy as having the highest amount of choice. And us as the physicians are at the top of this graph. We are mediating public health and public safety and autonomy and choice. It is our job to try and intersect these graphs as much as we can. We obviously can't control everything. So for instance, opiate prescriptions. We can severely restrict a patient's autonomy by telling them which opiate we are willing to prescribe them because we know that it is safe for the public. We know the opioid pandemic is terrible. We know that it has horrible costs and horrible um, things that are done to patients. And so we try and mitigate that for them. But things like drinking. As physicians, we can counsel patients about alcohol use. Um, we can talk to them about the negative side effects of alcoholism, of downstream effects of cirrhosis, but ultimately patients hold the highest amount of choice and autonomy in these scenarios. So we know it's bad for public health. We know it's bad for public safety. We do our best to do right by our patients. Disability. So we know that patients who have disabilities can choose to apply for disability placards. They can come to a physician and say, I would like for the DMV to give me a special thing to help me feel safer getting in and out of my car, going to the grocery store, going to various options. We as physicians have the ability to sign off on those and give them that public safety sense. They still maintain a lot of choice because they can choose whether or not to apply for that. And we also can help mitigate the public health by giving them that disability placard. Masking mandates, another hot topic item in the pandemic that was up for huge debate. And we saw as physicians that we lost a lot of the ability to enforce this. I think we realized that we can enforce it in certain domains, like the hospital, for example, we can demand that people still wear masks in this space to feel safe. But public wise, when they leave the hospital or they go out into the public to the grocery store, whatever it may be, we can no longer tell them that they have to wear a mask. That is, we would like them to, but we cannot enforce that. And so public safety is sacrificed um, at the expense of patient autonomy and patient choice. And then there are things that I put up here on this graph just to illustrate that there are also things out of neither control. Patients can't really control the amount of pollution they're exposed to. So someone with hyperreactive airway disease can um, control the smog in the air if they don't have the resources to move. And as physicians, we can't really control that either. And there's currently nothing for us to do to mitigate this relationship. So there are things in this public safety autonomy spectrum that no one can really control that are still affecting everyone at large. And so when we bring this back to shared decision-making. How do we mitigate public safety, public health with autonomy and choice? Well, the way that most physicians engage in shared decision-making is what is known as normative shared decision-making. And that is to say that we present the patient with pros and cons, risks and benefits, and then they make a decision that is best for them. I think most people would agree that that is how we operate most of the time. I'll say 90% of the time. 
The problem when you think about normative shared decision-making is that for it to be as effective as possible, you have to know all possible outcomes and you have to know um, all possible outcomes for the benefit and for the disadvantage of the patient. So you have to know every risk and every benefit, which is near impossible for us to do. So even though we engage in this, it is inherently flawed. On the flip side, we have what's known as descriptive shared decision-making. And a lot of people argue that, and we will also argue as we talk about a path forward, that this may be where we should put a lot more of our efforts and resources is in descriptive shared decision-making. Descriptive shared decision-making takes into account internal and external factors, and it requires more complex thoughts around shared decision-making. So now, not only are you giving a patient options, but you're also asking them, what is your cultural belief around this option? What is your religious belief? What does your family think about this? Um, and that's what we really think shared decision-making should be. I think most physicians in this room would say, that's what I want to accomplish when I engage in shared decision-making. But I think limited by our system and by the time we have with patients, we often revert to engaging in normative shared decision-making because we still, we still value that the patient in the end makes the decision for themselves, regardless of the other people in their um, social circle. And so the question then becomes, what do we do um, for a particular scenario, when we haven't quite predicted the outcome, when we haven't quite told a patient that this could happen to you um, if we don't intervene, how do we resolve tension that arises when our ethical principles compete for the spotlight? And we'll highlight this with a second case. So Miss V, she's a 25-year-old female with no past medical history. She's admitted to the hospital for uh, delivery of her first child. Her male partner passed away in a car accident recently, so she comes in by herself. During the delivery, she has placental complications that lead to massive hemorrhage. When you ask to consent for blood transfusion, she tells you that she's Jehovah's Witness and she explains her cultural reasons for why she does not want to be transfused. She understands her risks and the, uh, that she could die if she continues to refuse this transfusion. And unfortunately, despite your continued attempts and maximum interventions to stop her hemorrhaging, she continues to hemorrhage. And you know that if you don't transfuse her soon, she will die. So I think for a lot of people, this brings up a lot of moral injury and conflict inside of themselves. And this is actually a real case that happened in Connecticut. So the OB who was overseeing this case actually went to the courts at the time to seek an injunction to say, it is against my job as a physician. I am supposed to adhere to beneficence. I am supposed to adhere to non-maleficence. I know that patient is autonomy has autonomy, but in this scenario, I feel like I'm being morally injured because my job is to save the patient in front of me. And by that reason, I want the power to transfuse her to save her. And also she's pregnant, so I need to save the baby. When he went to the court, what the court didn't know is that she had already delivered the baby. And so the court granted the injunction. They said, sure, you're right. Beneficence, non-maleficence, transfuse her, save her life. She'll probably be better for it in the long run. The problem with this is that she survived. That, that's not, not necessarily the problem. Um, but the patient ended up surviving this case. Um, and she sued the hospital. She sued the hospital and the physician. And she said, you violated my right to an autonomous decision. I told you that I understood the risks and I still made that decision of sound mind. And you also implicated me not just physically, but emotionally, because now I am worried I no longer have eternal salvation because of the blood transfusion that you gave me. And so this went all the way up to the Connecticut Supreme Court. And does anyone know who won this case? Yeah, Brady said the patient. Um, yeah, so the patient won this case, actually. And so the courts agreed with her. They said, you know what? She's right. She was a sound mind. She had autonomy to self-determination. She can decide that she can die from her own decision-making. And it doesn't matter that it would have impacted the baby. It doesn't matter what the social context was. Um, it matters most that she had the right to choose for herself, which I think, um, again, brings up a lot of conflict for a lot of us. Um, and so I found this quote to be quite poignant in thinking about this. This was in the context of a resident who wrote a, a perspective piece in Nijam about taking care of an oncologic patient. He said that when the patient came in, um, he talked to the patient, talked through their disease was progressing, and the patient said that they knew they were at end of life and they were comfortable with DNR. He had come to terms with his death. And so the resident made him DNR. The patient said, but can my daughter come to bedside and I can chat with my daughter? And so the physician said, sure, I don't know if you'll make it in time, but sure, have her come in. Daughter comes to bedside. Daughter talks to her father and says, you have so much more life to live. You have so much to give. You're a fighter. You can keep going. You can keep doing this. After that discussion, the patient reverses his DNR decision. He makes himself full code. 
The patient continues to decline over the course of the next couple of days, gets cognitively delirious, can't really make decisions for himself, and uh, his oncologic um, disease continues to progress to the point that he's close to needing intubation. And the family becomes extremely distressed because they don't like seeing um, the devastating effects of what is happening, and they are conflicted in their decision to have had reverse his choice to make him DNR. So with another discussion that the resident had with the family, they ultimately revert back to his original choice to make him DNR and the patient died within 24 hours. And so I found this quote to encapsulate, I think, how a lot of us feel in these scenarios because we've all, I think, been there at times when we've gone back and forth with code discussions. And it reads, in medical training, we are taught to respect autonomy, to take the patient's wishes as the final word. But I wasn't taught how to reconcile conflicting values. I didn't know how to help my patient weigh his wish to die peacefully against his desire to make a decision his family could accept. And so this kind of highlights what we're going to discuss about individualistic autonomy versus relational autonomy. And the first thing that we're going to talk about is this individualistic autonomy. Um, and we'll walk through that and we'll talk about how relational autonomy is in contrast to that. And again, potentially a way that we can move forward post-pandemically. So when we are considering individualistic autonomy, there are certain principles that make up individualistic autonomy. Those are self-reliance. So the patients are only reliant on themselves and no one else. They're independent in their decision-making. They are making their own decisions. They are not making decisions for someone else. They are self-aware of their biases and the things that influence them in their decision-making. And they are still able to say, this is my own decision. And they have self-interest. Again, when we talked about in the public health versus autonomy argument, they are only interested in the self. It doesn't matter what anyone else thinks. It doesn't matter how this will impact anyone else around them. And there are certain criteria that one must fulfill in order to be truly individualistic and in autonomy decision-making. The first is that they have to be authentic, meaning that the patient had to come up with the idea themselves. No one could have told them the idea. It came from their mind and they are consistent in their desire for that decision. It has to be free from influence. And this means influence from anything. Influence from physicians, influence from the media, influence from society, from culture, from religion. It literally has to only be the patient that is uh, making their decisions and um, thinking about them. And then they have to be competent, which we all know in our decision-making models, we always assess people's capacity for decision-making of, are they of sound mind? Can they make a, a choice about this decision? But what's interesting is that there are several counter arguments to the fact that individualistic autonomy, despite it being what's highly valued in medicine right now, doesn't really exist. And the reason is that one of these principles is you have to be free from influence, and it is near impossible to be free from a social influence. Everything around us is constantly influencing our decisions. Um, and when you think about this in terms of the pandemic, too, you think about the media, think about politics and how that played into the way that people were coming into the hospital and asking for certain treatments, asking for certain things, or not following certain rules or adhering to certain things that we had put into place. And we know that when patients engage with medical providers, oftentimes in today, kind of going back to this consumeristic point of view is that we engage in a contractual obligation many ways. It's not a written contractual obligation, but it is an obligation between physician and patient that I will present my patient with the risks and benefits and I will guide them as much as I can. Ultimately, that patient gets to decide what is best for them. And it's because of this contractual obligation that people argue that individualistic autonomy doesn't exist because it blinds us to everything else that we actually care about as physicians. We care about beneficence. We care about non-maleficence and responsibility. But when we hold individualistic autonomy to its highest value, we no longer view that as being super important. And it's this, con it's this contract that we enter into that then doesn't really allow us to do that because we are adding our influence to a patient's decisions, whether or not we think we are. And so this quote, um, again, from a different paper, I thought encapsulated very well us moving into the pandemic and things that we started to value a little bit more in regards to autonomy. It said, in particular, an, individual, an individualistic understanding of autonomy seems to disregard important social values, such as justice, solidarity, and social responsibility, which are all things that we came to value a ton when the pandemic hit. And Tiffany is going to discuss what autonomy looked like in times of the pandemic. Uh, Dante alluded to a number of the challenges of using autonomy or individualistic autonomy as the sole lens through which we approach these difficult situations. Um, some of the challenges we specifically wanted to highlight is that there are cultural differences in the way that we 
and what autonomy actually means and then the value that is placed on autonomy in different societies. So we live in a very individualistic uh, society where emphasis placed on the individual and individual choice is regarded very highly, but this isn't always the case. So certain cultures, um, cultures that really value collectivism or the choice based on the family unit or the society at large um, really don't value patient autonomy in the same way. And so recognizing that um, the university, the universality, it's not a universal concept through which we apply um, uh, this framework to all medical ethics. Additionally, there's not a lot of room for physician expertise in a truly autonomous model at its extreme, where we kind of deliver a set of options to a patient and then they choose amongst them. We lose that opportunity to guide them through that process. And in some ways, we run the risk of abandoning them, abandoning them to make those difficult decisions without any guidance. And then lastly, individualistic autonomy can fail to capture the relationships and interconnectedness in which we make these decisions. And so we saw this huge shift again over the last two millennia from no patient autonomy to autonomy being very respected in the medical decision-making process. But then when COVID-19 hit, we saw a necessary shift back at least toward the middle. And there were reasons, um, a lot of reasons for that. We saw this reflected um, in, you know, like across the newspapers, we saw things that said chilling plans for who's gonna get care when the hospitals fill up. How are we gonna triage those resources? Who's gonna get ventilators? There was a lot of panic about that. And we also saw articles that stated that perhaps there was futility in providing CPR for patients who were hospitalized and suffered a cardiac arrest? And were we gonna take away that patient's agency to make the decision on their code status, all within the lens of trying to spare exposure to healthcare providers? We saw the shift from de-emphasizing autonomy to emphasizing the ideas of utilitarianism or the greatest good for the greatest number and justice. So here is a common case, one that I experienced when I was in the ICU. Mr. M, he's 65 years old. He's admitted with chronic he's admitted with acute on chronic respiratory failure from COVID-19. And he's doing pretty poorly, um, but not yet intubated. And he's heard a lot about the benefits of ivermectin and treating COVID-19. And this is the treatment that he wants to receive instead of the steroids and supportive care that you have been providing him. And after several discussions um, regarding your understanding of the current literature and lack of benefit from providing ivermectin, He's insistent and, prog and becomes progressively frustrated with the medical team when it's not given to him. We found ourselves stuck in the situation of trying to balance competing values. Do we honor this patient's autonomy, give him the ivermectin? Um, this is something like we're really practiced at doing where patient's voice um, has been such a critical and played a critical and central role in making medical decisions. Or are we forced to devalue that um, for the benefit of these other principles like non-maleficence? Am I gonna harm him by giving him a treatment that is not medically indicated? Is he gonna have some unforeseen side effect? Or even from a bigger societal lens, am I gonna perpetuate misinformation that we know is already running rampant by giving him this treatment that we know has no evidence? And then lastly, um, not mentioned up here, but should we not provide the treatment that we think can help him get better is this gonna to lead to a longer hospital stay? And in that case, what are the implications for utilitarianism and justice um, in this particular case? And while many of us didn't take care of someone who was demanding ivermectin, we saw similar situations really over the last three years where um, kind of that idea of consumerism that Dante alluded to was really prominent. Now consider a more feared scenario. You're a triagist where peak pandemic resources are extremely limited. Um, the hospital currently has one ICU bed and one ventilator, and you're asked to go evaluate a patient who has worsening respiratory failure. And based on their trajectory, you're worried they're gonna need to be intubated. And all of a sudden you're tasked with like ranking patients in some way. You're either ranking them on a patient characteristic or you're assigning value or using some value framework to decide who gets that resource. If you choose a first come first serve model, then you may be respecting patient autonomy and beneficence. You're doing right by that patient and you're respecting their decision. 
but this is likely at the sacrifice of utilitarianism. You may not be able to save as many lives because that resource is now been used and someone who may have been able to survive or had a higher likely, likelihood of surviving didn't get that resource. Do we consider survivability scores? Dr. Maida's talk a couple weeks ago on um, creating crisis standards of care uh, really demonstrated that if we use mortality-based or survival, survivor, bleh, survivability based scores, we're often perpetuating age-based, race-based, or disability-based discrimination. And there, um, and despite our best efforts to kind of mitigate those effects, it continues to be a challenge. Should we consider whether or not this person was a smoker or if they were vaccinated or if they're a healthcare worker? Would your decision change if I told you that the only reason this person wasn't vaccinated was because they couldn't afford to take time off of work to get the vaccine or they simply didn't have access to care? Or what if I told you that the reason this person wasn't a healthcare worker was because of the structural barriers and inequities that exist in our system that prevented them from seeking higher education? We're stuck making an impossible decision from a host of impossible decisions and coming to terms with the fact that utilitarianism does not always equal justice. And in fact, the decision to save the most number of lives often perpetuates the injustice that exists in our system. And for me, the COVID pandemic was the first time I really had to come to reality with, with, you know, with these realities in general. But there are providers who are practicing in resource poor settings every day pre-pandemic who have to make these decisions all of the time. Now imagine that you're that triagist and you decide to admit the patient to the hospital and you're gonna give them su supportive care, but if she continues to worsen, you will not allow her to um, decide her code status. She won't be intubated. And ultimately she does decline and passes away. And you did this all in the hopes that you were protecting a limited and valuable resource for a hypothetical patient who never comes. And just imagine the amount of moral injury and trauma that comes from making that decision. And I think perpetuated a lot of the burnout that we're seeing now, especially in the post pandemic phase. So I just wanted to highlight justice does not always equal utilitarianism and what a challenge it is to design these crisis standards of care that try to support both. Thank you, Tiffany. And yeah, so as we're talking about um, coming out of the pandemic. So what is our path forward, really? We saw in the pre-pandemic phase, the pendulum really swung in favor of patients. We were really on that autonomous side. They were allowed to make a lot of these decisions, whether or not we agreed with them, um, whether or not we thought it was the best choice for them necessarily. And then in the pandemic, as Tiffany discussed, we saw it swing all the way to the other side to public health, where we were now making decisions on patients' behalf, even if it mean that they had to die at the hands of others, because we were saying that for the good of everyone else, for the good of public health, for utilitarianism to thrive, um, we need to have a um, codifying to say that we will not intubate these amount of people or we will not um, allow these people to be full code. And that was really morally injuristic. And I think if you think about either side of the pendulum, there is moral injury on both sides. There is moral injury when we highly value patient autonomy to the point that it blindsides us to everything else. And there is moral injury when we don't consider patient autonomy, when we don't allow them to make a decision. And so we are going to propose that Part of our way forward is going to be talking about relational autonomy in the future. And so relational autonomy is really thinking about what are all of the factors that go into an autonomous decision. And so for someone, there's all these intersections of their identities of things that influence how they come to make a decision for themselves. Things like family, we know that this is super important in family care discussions, especially for end of life care and palliative care brings them in for this reason that we know that the influence they hold on folks, and this is, as we'll see, will vary for different patients. Culture plays a huge role in the ways that people believe in how they should die, where they should die, <clears throat> or the decisions they make. Religion has a heavy influence on folks. Politics, again, as we saw in the pandemic, this became a huge web that people wove to try and justify their decisions or for us to even justify why we wouldn't do things for patients. Ethnicity, socioeconomic status, race, assigned sex, all of these things are things that are part of our identities that are crucial to who we are that come into play when someone asks us, what would you like to do? Here are your treatment options. What are you going to do? We are considering all of these things, whether or not we are conscious of it. And so 
I just threw this up here to highlight that this looks different for everybody though. Not everyone has the same makeup or values the same things for themselves. And I threw in here the role of the physician because as we know in practicing medicine, some patients really heavily rely on us to make decisions for them. They say, I trust whatever you think, doc. If you think that this drug is best for me, then we'll make it work. Other patients may say, well, I care what you think, but I care a lot more about what uh, my family thinks, what my culture says, my racial identities matter more in this scenario. So while what you're telling me is not null and void, I may not weight it as much as I weight these other things. And so we see this spectrum for everyone is completely different. And for relational autonomy to thrive, we really have to be digging into our patients more and exploring these relationships more, figuring out which of these bar graphs our patients fits into to better understand how they're coming to a decision so that we can give them decisions, uh, we can give them options that make sense to them. And it allows us as physicians to regain a little bit of autonomy. We can be reasonable in our asks by saying, based on what you believe, based on your values and the things that I'm hearing from you, these are the options I feel will benefit you best. And it does not force us into giving them every requested resource. It does not force us into presenting so many options that they feel cognitively overloaded. We can tailor our options more often, and it may give us a sense that we are feeling more autonomous in this relationship with them. And so really what we should do is just reconceptualize autonomy. And it's not to say that relational autonomy doesn't value an individual. Um, if we move towards a relational model, we still value them. And actually what we come to find is that when you take into context all of the social aspects of someone's decision-making, you'll find that it enhances their decision-making and it enhances their autonomy. We can say, look, your culture and what you believe really wants to go down this path that should empower you to make that decision. And we are on board with the decision that you're making. And you can make that argument for any of the identities they hold. Relational autonomy aims to hold true that patients should still have control over themselves. They still hold self-determination, but they should do so in a social context. And again, when we consider all these are social relationships, we are having patients think about how is this going to impact everyone around you, not just yourself. So it, even though we tend to think of self-interest as solely being for the self, when we truly think about it, self-interest is also other interests. It also uh, interests the people around you and the parties that you're a part of. And so what we come to find is that shared decision-making should be the crux of what we do. And it actually can be the gold standard for us to move forward out of the pandemic. So as we carve our path forward, we should value society, we should value public health, public safety, and all these things, and we need to value individual autonomy. And this is where we can be the orchestrators of that relational autonomy. Relational autonomy takes into account both of these things, and it allows us to facilitate those conversations more easily. And we do this in our ability to engage patients and the forces that impact them in shared decision-making. Again, informed consent being the underpinning of shared decision-making, but we can engage more in the descriptive side of shared decision-making, take more time to carve out, for patients to really understand their decisions. And our role ultimately is to mitigate and to guide them, right? Our role is to tell them that we think that this is the best option given what you have presented to me as being important to you. And that's where relational autonomy can really shine and where we think we should potentially head out of the pandemic is to say, this will not only be good for society, for your culture, for your family, but it's also good for you and you feel confident in making that decision. And so Tiffany will close us out by bringing us all the way back to Irma. Irma, just as a reminder, she's our 77 year old woman who has metastatic breast cancer on chemotherapy, chronic respiratory failure from her COPD and type two diabetes, who's coming into the emergency room with shortness of breath and found to have worsening respiratory failure from COVID pneumonia. I want to explore what her care might look like under these different models of medicine and then suggest a path forward. Under the beneficence model, which we discussed, was really characterized by maximum physician discretion and minimal patient involvement. Irma's getting intubated. She, there's not a discussion with Irma. We think that Irma could probably live a few more days, maybe even a few more weeks if she's intubated. There's no room for discussion about quality of life or patient agency under the beneficence model. As we move over to the autonomy model, we're gonna have a discussion with Irma. Um, we're gonna present her with options that might look something like, Irma, we can do everything. We could admit you to the hospital, give you medications, give you supportive care. And if your respiratory status worsens, we can intubate you and put you on a ventilator. 
Uh, option number two might look something like we admit her to the hospital and provide her medications, but she can refuse a ventilator if she worsens. And option number three might be that she decides to automatically transition to comfort care. Um, in its truest form of autonomy, this would be really outside of the influence from the physician. And we would kind of leave her with like a list of options in which she can choose. Dante and I'd like to argue that there's a better path forward that uh, Irma exists at an intersection of many identities, and that if we can understand her cultural, religious, social context, which are important pieces in conjunction with her medical context and medical reality, which informs those feasible decisions we could give her, we can translate these into patient values. And understanding Irma's values, we can use that information with our medical expertise to translate that into a small appropriate list of medical options for which she can choose, but that we should provide um, a medical recommendation. And in this way, I say that we would truly uh, support her autonomy. So what we learned about Irma, who was a real patient, her name is not Irma, but um, she was a real patient that I took care of during the pandemic, is that she was a grandmother of four grandbabies. The thing that brought her joy was to be able to cook dinner for her family and to play games, but these were things she really never got to do anymore because of the fatigue from her chemotherapy and from her shortness of breath from her lung disease. And that she wasn't afraid of dying. She had lived a long, great life and that she, her husband was already in heaven and she was excited to join him, but she was worried about dying alone and not having her family with her. And so at the end of Irma's case, our recommendation actually was two options. One is that we would admit her to the hospital and give her medications that may help support her through it. She may recover, um, though in the context of her medical comorbidities, we felt that if she were intubated, she'd be unlikely to be liberated from the machines. With the second option would be to transition automatically to focusing on comfort-focused care, which is what she chose. And she passed away on hospital day two, surrounded by her family that were singing her songs. So I feel like this is a better path forward than simply delivering options to patients to choose amongst their own and in, in some ways in a vacuum and better certainly than the beneficence model of medicine where we give them no option at all. And we just wanted to end by acknowledging all of those who helped us with our talk and are here to answer any questions. Thank you, Dr. Gardner and Dr. Mesa for that excellent and very thought-provoking talk on such an important patient care um, topic. And so with that, we'll open it up for questions from the audience and from online. Hey guys, uh, thanks so much for that amazing presentation. I think, especially for folks like us who trained through the pandemic, these uh, everything you highlighted in this talk is just so relevant and so important. When you guys were doing the research for this, did you find that um, there was more education around this in residencies or people talking about getting this information out to residents in a way to prevent some of that moral injury that you were talking about? I'm not sure that I saw anything that was specifically targeted to resident education, but rec there was like recognition of a need that like providers kind of on a mass level needed to have this skill set. And it's a skill set that we see like our palliative care colleagues like do extremely well. Um, one limitation that was frequently highlighted is that in order to like make this framework a reality is that we need to de-emphasize the volume of patients that we see and protect time to have those conversations. We can't understand who a person is and all the intersections of their identity in its totality in a 20 minute visit and make a plan for their medical care. Um, and so I think that there would have to be significant systemic changes to support um, that kind of ideal, idealized version of patient autonomy. I was struck by the quote that you talked about from the resident's perspective piece in the New England Journal of Medicine. Um, how do you think we do teach students and residents to be able to do this well? Uh, do you mind if I try to do it? I don't know if this is on. Oh, okay. Sorry. Do you mind uh, clarifying? Do like do shared decision making well or? Yeah, I think it's tough. Um, 
I feel like a lot of the skills I've learned in residency have been interacting with palliative care folks. Um, and I think, you know, it, there is some benefit to potentially having residents rotate on those services to be a part of those things in their training time to really learn how these discussions go. Because I think, yes, we know palliative devotes so much of that time that residents feel is super crunched. Like we don't have that hour and a half uh, of our day as we're like seeing so many folks to like sit down and really dive into that. But it's such an invaluable skill that they do because they do get at that relational autonomy very well, where they consider all of the identities that are impacting someone's decision. And so I think part of that, the way that we really have to teach residents to do that is to be in those discussions, to engage with them, to encourage, especially as interns, when they're learning these skills, is to like go to the family care discussion as upper levels. We should be taking their responsibilities and say, it's more important that you learn this because this is a lifelong skill. Uh, you don't need to know how to re replete potassium for the, less, for the rest of your life because that just becomes second nature. Um, but this is like a skill that you'll continue to work on and develop as you go. I know even as a third year engaging in so many conversations, I was still learning new ways and new tools to discuss with patients from our palliative care team. Thank you. I think time for one last question. Oh, it is one o'clock. So thank you guys again for um, that excellent talk. We really appreciate it. Thanks, Julie.